Voilà, je vous demande d'accueillir M. Francis Ford Coppola. Je me souviens quand j'étais venu vous voir. J'étais venu vous voir en 1982, juste après Franck, pour les cahiers du cinéma. Et vous, vous nous aviez dit, je suis un, un industriel artiste. Je pense que c'est vrai. Well, what this makes me think of, I, I don't know that I ever saw this film, but I don't think I ever did, but of course it's... Uh, touching to see um, this period of, of optimism that we had, that I had. And, and the logic was not wrong, that there, there is something wonderful about the notion of a studio being a kind of repertory company. And uh, the, the notion of applying what was then an emerging technology, which was uh, electronics and digital electronics, to somehow uh, Uh, modernize the technology of cinema to make it uh, more um, uh, more uh, more expressive and flexible it has also made sense so you take all the elements you have the old-fashioned studio concept with its company of actors and uh, artists and technicians who are at home in a, in a, in a studio uh, w which is their their uh, their patron and then the concept of from theater, uh, which Bernard Gersten, who was there, was the associate of Joseph Papp. So I took, I reached to New York and took someone from the theater uh, with its traditions, uh, which were different than the L.A. traditions of a group of actors, the, the, the public theater, and the sensibility more of theater actors, and, and bring that to the studio and then to reach out towards the emerging uh, electronic of personal computers and networking and bring that to the studio so that somehow it could be a rebirth of what had been an old studio tradition but modernized in a good pro-artistic way. In a way, those different aspects were different aspects of myself because I had been raised and a student of theater in New York, and I had come to be an apprentice. Uh, I never worked within the studio, but I went to the UCLA Film School, which was, uh, the faculty were former studio people, and, and I received an education, and I was a boy scientist. So I loved technology, so each of those aspects of myself were represented in the The, the, the ingredients that I was trying to put together. I, I tell you a funny story, if I may, because I know you love uh, this person, but as a student, I was given the opportunity. I was very poor and very hungry to eat. <laughs> and I was invited, I gained an invitation to go to the studio in LA where Jerry Lewis was making The Ladies' Man which was a very interesting production for someone like me to see. And it was his birthday. So there was a huge cake there with happy birthday, Jerry, that looked like enough cake for a thousand people to me. But very interestingly, I was fascinated with how Jerry Lewis directed because on the cameras, he had attached a video camera. And there was a big old Ampex two-inch video recorder recording what the camera shot, the video camera was where the viewfinder is. It wasn't, it was a cinema camera, but it had an electronic viewfinder. So Jerry Lewis could act, and then he could see what he had done in a playback, which I thought was ingenious. And that is the real inven invention of what later has become known as video assist. After Jerry Lewis did this, innovation, it was forgotten, and I had never, and it was not used for many, many years until Zoetrope revived the idea taken from Jerry Lewis for One from the Heart, which was again the use of the video camera on 
a, a conventional cinema camera. Uh, and, and of course, after that, now it's, there is a movie made that doesn't at least have that. Um, about the cake, briefly, of course, I was very attracted to the video camera, but more attracted to the cake. <laughs> so I went, it was so big, I went as close to the cake for the birthday so I could get a piece. And when he began to cut it and hand it to me, of course I felt well, I should hand it to the other people. And so I did all the pieces. And in the end, there was no more cake. And I never got a piece of the cake, which is the metaphor for my life. <laughs> I can talk at great length about the ideas behind that Zoetrope studio. Uh, one small idea I will throw out to you and then wait for what questions so that I'm sure to answer what uh, in discussion. But when I tried to explain to all my colleagues why I wanted uh, it to have a computer network, which was by then a very unknown, in fact, barely done thing. This is before the Apple computer. This is before Microsoft, uh, not before Microsoft, but maybe at that time. The real company who developed the personal computer was Xerox and their experimental lab in Palo Alto. And this lab uh, was where all the ideas of the modern, the graphic interface, the mouse, all those things were invented by Xerox. And Steve Jobs and, and, and Mr. Gates, all of them took because Xerox was a copy company and didn't protect their inventions. But they did make a, a computer called the Xerox Star. And everyone wanted to know, well, what are we going to do? I bought two Xerox Star computers. They looked like sort of like uh, the Apple Macintosh computer, but they were not. They were the Xerox Star, the original. I bought two of them on credit, which they eventually repossessed. And everyone wanted to know, how will we use these things? And I said, well, imagine we have a big clothesline. And the clothesline goes out of my office and goes through the writing department and goes out the window to the casting department and the art department and the cinematography department and comes all the way back. So it's a big clothesline going around. And we have a clothespin and we take a note which has the or idea of a story. And we take it and it goes into the writer's department and they work on it, and on the clothespin, they put the story, and then it goes to the casting department, and they look at it, and they choose the actors. So every department will be connected through an electronic network. And we then took the one I had, and we put the other one in the room where the secretary typed the scripts, and we sent the script, I think, of uh, the escape artist, went like that, and. We took champagne and we toasted it because that was the first link. And of course, it came out in the other department where it was typed. And I said, this is the beginning. But one day, there will be hundreds of, uh, of these um, little places where the clothesline goes. And, and that was the concept of having a, st a, a studio with actors and departments all connected by a computer network, which was you know, a new thing. In conclusion of this little talk, watching your film, I realize what my flaw was and why ultimately, ultimately we failed. I lost the studio and I ended up in debt for 10 years, which is why you have Peggy Sue got married and the Outsiders and uh, the Tucker even. My flaw was, if you notice, I said, if we have the means of production, the equipment, then we can make films. And I said, but no, I realized it's not the equipment that is the means of production, it's the money. But I was wrong. It's not the equipment that's the means of production or the money that's the means of production, it's the distribution, the control of the distribution that's the means of production. And that's the one department of the studio I wasn't interested in. Uh, it's so good to see you again, Francis. I mean, 35 years ago, um, a long, um, uh, I would say that a lot of things changed in between. And uh, one of the questions I asked you back then, which is in the film, which is actually just excerpts. This is not a finished film. We never finished the film, as a matter of fact. Uh, uh, let's talk about that. 
Uh, but my question is, which was already at that time for me a very important question too, uh, since you uh, were also uh, very inventive in, in the use of, of image and sound uh, with, with that technology. The question of the new language. Now, after 35 years, how, how do you feel what you envisioned at that time and how did it change in reality? What's, what's the differences and which are... Well, I could talk a long time about this. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, about f four years ago, when did... Um, what was the great 3D film that... Uh, our Avatar. When Avatar came out, so maybe four years ago, everyone was talking, now the future of the cinema is 3D. <coughs> I remember DreamWorks said, oh, every film will be 3D. And I thought, well, gee, I remember we had 3D uh, in, in, in the Buana Devil in the 3D. We had House of Wax in 3D, and we had... Uh, there's always a film in 3D every 20 years, and then everyone says... And then even Hitchcock made Dial M for Murder. No one saw it in 3D. So I said, to say that the 3D is the future of cinema, cinema is too big, too interesting for the simple idea of 3D to be any kind of future. Uh, so I said, well, you know, I, I don't... The only difference from this time and the past was that now televisions are very easily made in, for 3D. And I said, possibly because... The television sets could be three. Maybe it will stick around longer. But tr true to what I thought, 3D is gone the way it always is, where it's, it was beautiful for Avatar, and, and uh, Marty Scorsese used it in an imaginative way for Hugo. He tried to really make it the, an essential part of the cinema, and perhaps even gravity benefited. But more or less, when you make a movie now, you don't necessarily consider that it has to be 3D, of course. But that made me think, what was the future of the cinema? So I thought the future of cinema lay in two or three areas. Number one, the writing. Because even a form like the novel, which maybe we can say is 400 years old, more or less, I think, the novel itself has gone through a wonderful evolution of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of what a novel was. And there are many areas in the novel that we can learn from for the cinema. The use of point of view, of uh, the subjectivity, uh, of the sense of consciousness. Uh, I remember books like by Alain Robrier saying, for a new novel. I remember a book by Ortega E. Gassad about for the novel. So if the novel, just in the writing, is capable of great evolution, which we even saw so, so much in France with Flaubert and certainly in, 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 in Russia with Tolstoy and Dostoevsky uh, and Goethe himself who wrote early novels. That means just the writing part of cinema in itself is capable of, uh, of, of revolutions and revolutions just in what storytelling is and how one prepares a story um, uh, for a novel, or a play, or, or a film. So in that alone, there the writers, the young writers out there who are going to revolutionize the cinema, that's an area of great fertility. Not to mention Joyce and, uh, and uh, Virginia Woolf and, and more contemporary uh, innovators of the novel. The second area that occurred to me that's a gr very fertile uh, possibility of new cinema lay in the form related to the documentary and the fiction film, and the documentary and fiction film combined, such as the beautiful film that Sarah Polly made called Stories People Tell, which, in which she told a story in a documentary style, and it was thrilling because of, in the end, it revealed a personal, the artist's life in a very beautiful way. So that whole area of the documentary and fictional film working together in new ways is another area of new language of cinema. The third area, which has always been of tremendous excitement to me and what really was in my mind for one from the heart, being a child not only of television, because I'm born in 1939, 
and we saw the first television in America around 1945, and it was live television, of course, because there was no video recorder until the mid-50s. So the concept of live television always fascinated me, and my goal with One from the Heart was to make a film in the style in which you make live television. So, if today every movie theater in the world has an electronic projector and one of great beauty and resolution, and if it's possible that they can all be networked by satellite, it means for the first time in history have the projectors been supplied not by a film print, which was a physical fact, but by digital files, which are by nature virtual, it means we have a new kind of medium that we never had before. Now I stop here for a second, I will try to be brief because I realize this is, I will stop for a second and say for how long has art been recorded? Well, it took technology to enable art to be recorded. So I'll guess maybe it was the first photograph, maybe 1830s, where people could say, my God, it's just like that person, but it's a, a picture, it's not a painting, it's a real picture. And that must have astounded people. And quickly after that came the record player, the Victrola, the talking machine, and then the cinema in which the pictures could move. And at each point, the audience, as we saw in Hugo, was astounded <clears throat> to see the picture of a train. <clears throat> they were so frightened, they ran out because the mere act of seeing recorded art was a thrill. But the fact remains that for almost 200 years, our principal art is canned, it's recorded. Everything we see is recorded. Only one thing, even news you know is canned. The news you get is not really the news, it's, you're gonna get the real news 20, 20 weeks later. The only thing that's not canned is sports because no one knows what's gonna happen when they play the game. Now, in the 19th century, say, in the tradition of the great virtuoso conductors, Wagner, uh, Von Bülow, Richard Strauss, etc., etc., Mahler, they were not just orchestra conductors, they were employed by the Dresden Opera House, the Berlin Opera Company, and they were the leader of the entire uh, the corps de ballet, the orchestra, the scenic, the everything. They were the movie directors of their time, these, these uh, great uh, people. But the difference is that when the evening, after all the rehearsal, after all the preparation happened, they stood up before the audience and they gave a performance, which must have been thrilling. But that performance has been lost because when we make a film, we don't give a performance anymore. Six months, it's edited, it's preview, it's tested. What you, the audience, get is very beautiful often, but we have lost an element that theater had, that music had, that opera had, which we no longer have, which is the performance. Today, many things have been invented since the time of the golden age of live television in the 50s, mainly through sports and the Grammy show and the Oscars. There are so many tools that these people doing sports use uh, it, that it's amazing to sit in the truck during a football game and see what's really going on. So in effect, between the theaters with the electronic screen all over the world, the ability to unite them by satellite and the ability to create a program using tools it's almost as though a grand new musical instrument has been invented. And when a grand new musical instrument is invented, sooner or later, someone will come along and play it. And that is what I call live cinema or living cinema, using this fantastic array of new tools, so much so that no one even knows what live cinema is, because it's never been. And as we know, if I may add before I, I know I have to conclude, when there was radio, there developed a unique way of telling a story through radio, we know. When there was cinema, 
The pioneers created a unique, among the Mabalgans, a unique way, a language of telling cinema. The, 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 the close-up, which was outrageous. How, could, how did they think the close-up could ever work? Yet the audience, the mind, used the close-up. The parallel cutting, the same thing. So I believe that the language of live cinema, we can't know because there's a unique way of telling a story with those tools that no one will know until some pioneers teach us. And that is the third area of the exciting new area of cinema that I wish to add. And now I'm done. Monsieur Kouba, tout ce que vous dites me fait penser à Rossellini. Rossellini, dans les années 60, a voulu, a pensé que la télévision serait le nouveau média de la connaissance, de la transmission. Et il a fait beaucoup de films pour son film sur Marx, son film sur Socrate, son film sur plein, j'en oublie, plein de films sur, pour éduquer le, le, le public. Vous, vous êtes dans une, dans une autre dimension qui est la dimension de l'électronique. Mais le, le, le point de passage pour moi entre vous et Rossellini, c'est ce goût que vous avez qui est fondamental pour l'utopie. Vous, well, vous avez besoin d'utopie. Rossellini was a father to of us all. Without Rossellini, there wouldn't have been Fellini, Visconti, and... and uh, Godard, and so... You know, and uh, a hundred other filmmakers. So he was a great father. Uh, but... Um, You know, this is a, we live in a very exciting time and one in which I would expect tremendous change and experimentation. It's a, it's a, it, it, there is a beautiful capability and uh, so, you know, cinema can be a live cinema w which has performance, but it can continue to be uh, classic cinema which is edited. But one last point I would like to to note that here and now at uh, uh, 2.20, uh, it is no longer appropriate to talk about television and movies. It is one, it is cinema, it's the same thing, except it could be two minutes, it could be two hours, it could be 90 hours, it could be seen in the home, it could be seen in the theater, it could be seen in the community center, the church, It is everywhere, and it's where the public wants it. This idea that the theater owners have, that there is a window, that you can only see a movie for five weeks, it's a joke. The audience will see the movie when they want to see it. So let's not use the term television anymore. Let's not use the term theater. Of course, it's one thing. It's cinema. It will be available everywhere, whenever the, the, the audience wants it. It's very important what you say that. 20. No longer television, yeah. no longer yeah. But, all cinema. Mais vous avez, quand vous dites ça, vous pensez que le cinéma a gagné They both won. It's not a battle. It's, uh, you know, you know, it's, uh, I don't even know what television is anymore, or what, I mean, or what movies. Cinema is the king. Movies is a thing with film you show in only in theaters. Television was an electronic little box you showed only in homes. That's all finished. So I, don't, I think we have won the battle. <laughs> Artists have won the battle. Audiences have but won the battle, I think. Frank? Uh, yes, of course. Um, um, part of what we saw before is, is, is uh, not so funny uh, in, this, in the sense that, that this... this ideal, this dream, splashed uh, in the beginning of a time uh, where Wall Street was coming up, where the studios was earned by, by all companies. Um, how do you feel now when you look back? What, what is your feeling? You tried to do something which was not fightable. Or let me put it in another way, a great Dutch poet, Luce Beer, uh, said, Anything of value is defenseless, cannot defend itself. How, how do you feel now looking back? Well, all great success is made up of a thousand failures. The Zoetrope studio I had, which was my dream, was one of many failures, and I will continue to have, but I'm still, 
I'm still moving towards the goal, and, and when, I, when I'm gone, uh, many others will continue for a, a goal uh, of uh, beauty and enlightenment and, uh, and harmony between people. And, uh, you know, we will one day have free energy. Think of what impact that will mean to, to this idea of utopia. We will one day live in a world where people are so educated that they are tolerant of other ideas and uh, enjoy other ideas the way we enjoy uh, other food <laughs> of other cultures. So I'm very optimistic about the ultimate success of this pathetic little zoetrope studio. You know, there was one big flaw. I did all this, but I had no money. Marlon, I came, you know, I named all the alleys, you know, Sir Alexander Corda Boulevard, uh, uh, D.W. Griffith, uh, Sergei Eisenstein Park, you know, and I showed Marlon, I said, look, there's Marlon Brando Alley. And he says, where are you getting the money for this? At this time, Mr. Coppola, I remember, thanks to Tom Luddy, who is here, moi, j'étais venu vous voir euh, à San Francisco et il y avait tous les Européens venaient vous voir. Vous étiez, vous incarniez quelque chose de le renouveau du cinéma. Il y avait Wim Wenders, il y avait Werner Herzog, il y avait Chris Marker, il y avait Godard, il y en avait beaucoup d'autres. Qu'est-ce qu que vous avez qu -ce que, Comment vous, cette époque vous revient en termes de, de rayonnement comme ça Vous étiez vraiment, vous aviez 40 ans et vous incarniez vraiment... Le, une utopie à Hollywood, c'était fondamental. Well, you know, uh, utopia isn't really, well, of course, we know what it means. In Greek, it means the place that can't exist. But it's not a place, it's an ideal. And it, it, just as it may die here, it will spring up there. So, uh, you, you know, it's like the white horse in Viva Zapata. <laughs> You can't stop it because people will aspire towards ideas of beauty and and uh, happiness and love. You know, those are just part of us. So I, uh, of course, I'm nostalgic. I loved that studio. I loved that studio, and I didn't really lose it for clear. I mean, I lost it, but I lost it from my own stupidity. Um, so I feel honored that I could be part of that. And, uh, and, uh, and, you know, I'd made a very interesting transition because in those days I went from the movie business to the wine business and I made a much bigger fortune in the wine business than I had ever made in the movie business. So now, you know, and also I've lived to see my granddaughter, Gia Coppola, who is the fifth generation in the cinema of the Coppola family, five, one, two, three, four, five, and see her make her first film. It, fills me with uh, happiness and optimism, you know, that it goes on, it goes on, it goes on. Une famille d'artistes. Because my, un my, my grandfather, Augustino Coppola, was the one who engineered and built the Vitaphone. So that's the first generation. His, my, my mother's father, Francesco Pinino, lived on, with the family on top of a movie theater and imported the first Italian movies into America. So that was the first generation. And of course, we know about uh, my father as a musician, won an Oscar, and uh, my children, and, and now my grandchild. It's uh, five generations. Et vous, vous avez encore le désir d'un film? I still want to make cinema. You are working on a project? Yes. And your wife, too. And that's very exciting. My wife is going to begin a movie on May 25th in Paris. In Paris. Eleanor. Yeah. Eleanor, stand up. Let them see. My wife of 52 years. Et mon épouse. Bravo. Nous sommes mariés depuis 52 ans. Bravo. Commence à tourner son film à Paris le 25 mai. Est-ce qu'on peut parler de One from the Earth, peut-être, avant la projection? Uh, sure. Well, you know, the, you know, in my life, most people, when they're very old, they're dying, they say, oh, I wish I had done this, oh, I wish I had done that, I wish I had done that. When I die, I 
I, my theory is that I will be saying, oh, I got to do that, and I got to be in the movie business, and I got to have, see my children make movies, and I got to be in the one, and I'm gonna be so busy thinking of all the things I did that when I die, I won't notice it. <laughs> but I have one regret, only one. And that regret is that three weeks before we went on One From The Heart, which was going to be shot in a live television style with multiple cameras. Every, why would I build Las Vegas in a studio when Las Vegas is 45 minutes away? It, because it was planned as live cinema even then with the, the Silverfish was the control and the musician, everyone was going to do a live performance, albeit only 10 minutes at a time because that was the limit of a roll of film. But two, three weeks before the film, Victoria Storaro came to me, Dean Teller said, please, Francis, can we not shoot with 20 cameras? Can we shoot with one camera? We'll go very fast because I can make beautiful light with 20 cameras. And because I love Victoria Storaro and the others, what I should have said, Vittorio, if you can't do it, I'll get someone who feels they can do it. But I couldn't say that. So in the end, I said, okay, we'll shoot one camera at a time. And the whole beautiful experiment at that moment was, was really thrown away, and I regret it. Not that maybe it would be a better movie or worse movie, but that I didn't get to do it. So I hope one day I do get to do it. I, I look at this audience, and I'm sure there are some young composers there and some young writers there and filmmakers and photographers and I love young people. I am, I am happy to be my age. And if they said, if uh, Mephistopheles said, you can be young again, I would say no, I like my age. And I am not jealous of the young people, but it makes me happy to see them and to see them do their work and, um, and I hope that uh, just as my own children learned many good things uh, from me, I hope everyone takes whatever they want from what I did. Uh, you know, take anything, it makes me happy uh, that, that uh, I live in, through you, in what you do, what the cinema will be in 100 years. If I can see a, a little spark of me, then I'm part of it. So I thank you.